Thank you, Penny, and thank you all for being here. Melanie did travel a long way to be with us, and I can assure you it is going to be worth your effort to be here this evening. She's an amazing presenter. She's done a number of presentations for us over the last couple of years. Uh, truly an expert in the care of individuals with dementia and um, Alzheimer's disease. I just want to talk two seconds about the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center, uh, particularly since we have a satellite office right on Flying Point Road, and I need to have you all know that so that if you need some assistance, our caregiver will set up an appointment and meet with you at the uh, Southampton office. There's also a wealth of information on that table over there, so please feel free to help yourself to the information. Uh, and also, uh, we have a sign-up sheet outside, and I, I heard that some people were hesitant about putting their emails down. We're not looking for your emails to solicit you for anything. What we do want to do is keep you uh, informed of future seminars that are going to be happening here on the East End. We're very focused on this area of Long Island. We know that it's an underserved population. We know that you have serious issues here, uh, and we want to be a part of this community to help you. So please, uh, don't be afraid to give us your email. We, we really just want to keep in communication with you about the upcoming seminars. Um, so the, the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center has been caring for families since 1983. So I like to think that we have a great deal of experience and knowledge uh, in my staff and myself and my board of directors uh, to be able to continue to help our families all throughout the greater New York metropolitan area. And one of the processes that we are very focused on is education. And that's uh, what we're doing here this evening. This is part of what we call our seminar series. We run a number of these seminars throughout the year. Uh, and this evening we bring them out here to the East End uh, with Melanie Bunn. Uh, Melly Bunn received a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing at the uh, University of North Carolina at Capitol Hill, a Master of Science degree in family health nursing at Clemson University, and a post-master certificate as a gerontological nurse practitioner at Duke University. Melanie gives over 200 presentations annually to health professional groups, community groups, law enforcement, families, and other groups interested in addressing issues of the care and needs of people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. In addition to everything that she does, she also volunteers for the Alzheimer's support groups uh, as a facilitator and has done that for over 25 years. So what we're bringing to you today is truly one of the most experienced uh, persons when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's. So please help me welcome Melanie Bunn. Figure out that I'm not from Long Island, is it? <laughs> it's so good to be with you to talk about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and I'll go ahead and tell you, I could talk, talk from now till next week, but I'm not going to. We're, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions, but I'll hang around um, if you want to ask me something individually or if you, you want to, I'll hang around and ask questions, so don't worry about that. Um, the other thing is if you, you come up with something later on and you want to ask me, um, the email there is on your handout as well and it's the best way to get in touch with me because I don't keep my phone on, I don't see my cell phone for days. I leave it in the car and I forget about it. We can do that in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> but um, so I, I sometimes forget about things. But my, I'm on email a lot, so don't hesitate if you've got um, questions. If you want to ask me something, um, go ahead and, and get in touch with me. So we're going to talk about what works and what doesn't work and why people with dementia are different. Now let me start by asking: How many of y'all are here? because you have somebody you spend time with, your family or a neighbor or somebody close to you who has Alzheimer's disease or dementia? Or Dan. Or Dan. That's okay too. Okay, how many of y'all are here? Some people might be here because it's their job to spend time with people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. How many of y'all aren't really here? Because <laughs> it is Monday night, right? And sometimes it can get like that. So we're going to talk about the reasons why people with dementia do the things that they do. And we're going to talk about the changes that happen to the structure of the brain, the changes that happen to the chemicals of the brain, a little bit about level of dementia, and a little bit about type of dementia, and then hopefully some ways we can change our behavior to make things go better for that person with dementia. So let's start with the 
idea of brain failure. Now say that with me. Brain, brain failure. failure. Has anybody ever known anybody with something like congestive heart failure? Have you ever known somebody with that? So you're going to walk up to that person with congestive heart failure who probably is what? Can't get, can't get a good breath. Are you going to walk up to that person and say, ma'am, you need to breathe better. <laughs> now, you can breathe better yesterday. Now, what you know she's always been stubborn. Are you going to do that? Why not? It would scare a person. It, it doesn't work. Are you going to walk up to somebody with kidney failure? Would you lean forward for me, please? <laughs> go, kidneys, go. Go, kidneys, go. Are you going to do that? Why not? It's they can't control it. It doesn't work. But all the time, all the time, loving people, loving people walk up to a person with dementia and say, now, Mom, now listen. Don't you know who I am? Now, Mom, now pay attention. And you know what? If Mom could pay attention, guess what? She wouldn't have dementia. So take a deep breath and let it out. Take a deep breath with me. Take a deep breath and let it out because people with dementia are doing the best they can with what they've got left in their brain. So let's look at some pictures. Now this is, these are hard pictures to see. So if you don't need to look at them, look at the person next to you, look at your papers or something, because the pictures are kind of hard, because these are pictures of what happens to the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So if you compare these two pictures, do you notice some differences? What's different? It's smaller, and it's actually going to shrink down to one-third. Not by one-third, one-third is left. What else do you notice is different? It's darker, and it's darker because as those brain cells die, they leave behind debris and inflammation. And that's a very dirty, irritated, inflamed brain. What else do you notice is different? The spaces are deeper, those grooves are deeper, and the reason they're deeper is because as the brain cells die, they collapse and they leave behind space. That space is filled up with fluid. And so now does it become really clear why this person can do things that that person can? Which one of those people can learn new information? The normal one. Which one of those people can take that information and apply it to a situation? Which one of those brains do you have? Now here's the better question. Which one of those brains do you sometimes act like you have? Because don't you all have days when you act like you're the person with dementia? And if you were watching the interaction, it would be awful hard to tell who was really sick and who was really just being stubborn and ornery and hard to get along with. But these people are doing the best they can. Now there's one more really important thing I need to tell you about these two brains. They were men. Now do you know why that's important? They were both men. Same gender. They were the same ethnicity. They were the same age. They were the same size. They had the same head circumference. So they were exactly the same except for the disease. And this man died from an accident. And this man died from his Alzheimer's disease. And that's important because we're not comparing a six foot four, 200 pound person and a five foot tall, 100 pound person. We're comparing two people who, from the outside, look the same. And so when you look at those two brains, they should have been the same, but they're not. But it's not just the outside that change in the inside, too. So this is memory, and this is the hippocampus, and this is a hole. Now, which is going to work better? The memory part is the hippocampus going to... So this is what happens, and this is... Part of what happens, I'm sorry, I can't So I'm sitting in my living room, 
and I'm watching Carolina basketball. <laughs> and I think, I need a diet cook. So I get up and I walk to my kitchen, and just as I get to my kitchen, my phone rings, and it's my sister. Hey, Wendy. Yeah, I got your email. Hey, that's a, even my family emails me. That's great. I think that's a wonderful idea. Your mom, mom would ever I sit and love that. Okay, well, we'll get together. What were you thinking? Saturday at 2 o'clock at the mall. Now, where do you want to meet? Downstairs, the belts, the, the Macy's in, near the shoes. I can find the shoes. Hmm. Now, are you bringing the pictures? Okay, well, I'll bring an album. Are you bring the kids? Okay, I'll bring Mac in. All right, I'll see you then. Okay. I love you. Bye. Put the phone down. Now, what's my problem? <laughs> have no idea what I'm doing in my kitchen. Some of y'all look real scared. But what I'll do is I'll go back to my chair, and just as I'm about to sit down, what'll happen? Diet Coke. If that's what happens to you, guess what? You're okay as far as I know. <laughs> because what happens is early on, and this is a challenge for families who are involved and people who are involved in the community, because early on what happens is people have all of their old memories. All the old stuff is still in there. What they lose is the ability to move anything from the conveyor belt into storage. And so what happens is I put Diet Coke on the conveyor belt and it starts rolling. And then what did I add? Saturday, 2 o'clock, mall, downstairs, Macy's, shoes, pictures, album. As soon as kid hit the conveyor belt, what happened to Diet Coke? It fell off. And that's what happens to people with dementia particularly with Alzheimer's disease dementia, is things continually fall off the conveyor belt. So what happens is, you're my sister, and we're planning to meet at the mall, okay? And you call me and you make plans, and then you go to the mall, and what happens when I don't show up? You call me, right? And what do you say? Where are you? And I said, what do you mean, where am I? Well, we're supposed to be today at 2 o'clock the morning. I haven't heard a thing about it. That's well, I called you three days ago. Well, I, maybe you need to go see your doctor, because I think there's something not working with you. Yeah, you want to the picture? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any, because what happened? Well, it went off the camera, and she starts to wonder what? <laughs> what's wrong with me? Or is it what's wrong with me? Because they get really confused sometimes. So the disease moves on, and there are fewer and fewer connections. And then it becomes more than just getting new information in. They actually start losing some of the old information. And things are still in there, but they're just not connected. So what happens is my son comes to visit me. But I'm not remembering myself as being 80. I'm remembering myself as being what? 40. Yeah, and so now who does he look like? Yeah. <laughs> so he may learn things about mama he didn't really want to know. So they lose connections and things become more and more complicated. A couple of things stick. The ability to do stuff sticks. So they find the car keys that y'all have hidden from them and get in the car. And what do they do? Crank it up. Put the foot on the brake. Put the car in reverse. Look out which windshield. Hit which pedal. And run right in the car behind them. And it's always a BMW or Mercedes. It's never some piece of junk something. It's always something really nice. So they have come with their power tools, and they just went away a couple of months ago, but now when they start getting back out in the spring, or the snow things, they could do less, but now this winter, they can't manage things like that. The other thing that sticks is emotional memory. Now, my sister gives me a hard time, and she argues with me. The next time she comes in to see me, what am I going to remember? I'm going to remember the argument. I'm going to remember I don't like her, I don't trust her. And so now I'm what? 
I'm mad at her. I may not remember why I'm mad at her, but what do I remember? Don't like you, don't trust you, and Daddy always loved you more. Because <laughs> that kind of stuff sticks. It's more than just a memory problem. This is actually hearing, and hearing is pretty good. This is actually understanding, and the person with dementia just has that little ridge right there. So they lose their ability to understand what it is that you're saying to them. But my folks with dementia aren't stupid. There's a big difference between being stupid and having dementia. In fact, in my career, and I've worked in a lot of different environments, a lot of different systems, I've met a lot more stupid people without dementia than I've really met stupid people with dementia. And so what happens to people who are trying to do a good job is something like this. Now, now you're still taking your medication, aren't you? Not having any trouble with it. You're still sleeping okay at night? And you're not driving anymore, are you? People have trouble about lying. They lie to me about their medications. They can lie to me about their sleep and their pain. But it comes to driving. Uh, you're not driving anymore, are you? Well, I think you're doing great. Come back in six months. And his family's behind him going, what? Is he trying to lie to me? He's just filling in the blanks. This is where sits free motor is. This is where, particularly down here, this is what you have for speech and language. This is what the person with dementia has. And so early on what happens is they get that tip of the tongue. They can't get the word out that they need. And so they start substituting. So I start saying something like, now the next time you come, we need to, um, Go ahead and, and do that so they don't cut them off. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> like, no idea, but maybe she'll go away. <laughs> so they start getting very vague. What did it, does anybody know what I wanted her to do when she comes over? Change a light bulb. Well, that's this. You don't change many light bulbs, do you? Because that's this. What's this? Right up. Check. So they don't cut off the... Now some of y'all are a little loosely wired. <laughs> and those of y'all who are loosely wired will put together stuff and make it make sense. Those of y'all who are a little more linear will struggle with this kind of stuff. But you can learn to do this. It's a skill. It's not a gift. It's a skill. And that means you can learn. It just takes a little bit of practice. The disease moves on, and there are fewer and fewer words, and they get vaguer and vaguer in their words, except for certain kinds of words. And there are certain words and types <clears throat> of speech that are stored over here, and if you compare this to this, <clears throat> lots of changes. But if you compare this to this, you see there actually is a lot preserved. Three things are over there. The first thing that's over there is automatic speech. So if I say, good evening, what do you say back? If I say, thank you, what do you say back? If I say, how are you, what do you say back? You don't really think about those answers, do you? They're just kind of like, these will get you in trouble. Because what happens is people come to visit me, and I'm the person with dementia, and people who care about me come to visit, and I go, well, hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? Fine. How's your family? Fine. Well, you look great. Fine. Come back and see me. Now, I'm the person with dementia, you're not. Okay. <laughs> hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? Good, how's your family? Well, you look great. Come, come back and see me. Hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? Well. Good, how's your family? Wonderful. Well, you look great. Come back and see me. And so the reason this will get you in trouble is they go back, and they might be my family, or they might be neighbors, or they might be people from my faith community, and they come and visit, and then they go back and they start talking to everybody they know. And what they start saying is, I went by to see Melanie. There's not a thing wrong with her. 
We had a wonderful conversation. She asked about the children. And what they don't realize is I can turn around one time. Hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? How are you? <laughs> and it's like it never happened because they don't store, but that automatic social chip. So I look great, but you don't live with me. <laughs> and that's real different. That's the first thing that's over there. The second thing that's over there is music and rhythmic speech. And that's why people can't have a conversation with you, but they can sing all of the verses of a hymn or a sacred song. And they remember scripture. And they remember poems. And they remember prayers. And that stuff sticks. And they've still got that. And they can still use that. And we need to celebrate and use that more. But I said there were three things over there, right? The third thing that's over there? Cuss words. <laughs> sex words. And racial slurs. Now, do y'all all know those words? You do? You also know what to do with them, don't you? Because somebody who loved you taught you what? We don't say those words in this family, in this faith community, at this school. We don't say those words. Did you erase those words like you did your high school Spanish? You do not. You move it over there so you can do what? Pull them out on special occasions. <laughs> And so if I go to my car at the end of this program, or my, not at my car, or I go to her car, and I, I put the scum in and I slam the trunk on my favorite. My favorite cuss word will come to the front of my brain. I will take a deep breath. I will pause. I will say, Lord, I'm mercy. Oh, man, that hurt like a big dog. But I'm not going to say, the cuss word, because I have too much respect for the Alzheimer's Disease Resource Center. I have too much respect for this wonderful library for sponsor hosting. I have too much respect for, for the people who live here. I'm not going to say that cuss word. If I'm in my driveway, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around that's going to come out of my mouth. I'm going to use some of those words if I choose to. I've got other words I can substitute. Plus, this is the last part of we're going to look at. This is your frontal lobe. Right up here. This is the part of your brain that doesn't fully finish developing until late teens or early 20s. And that's why 14 and a half year old children should not be taking driver's ed. And I say that as someone whose son will be 14 and a half in March. <laughs> but they don't have the frontal lobe development and it gets, it gets lost very early. And so this is the part of your brain that allows you to behave differently at a baseball game than you do at a wedding. You know, this is the part of your brain that allows you to think this is appropriate to say here and it's not appropriate. It allows you to follow the rules. It allows you to organize yourself. It allows you to think things through and sequence them and prioritize and respond in the ways that are appropriate. And that's why if you're sitting here in this room and something itches, now everybody itches, don't you? Because once I start talking about it, everybody starts to have a little something, <laughs> depending on where it is, is what you're going to do about it. Because there's certain things you're just not going to reach down there and start scratching just because they itch. But if a person's got dementia and something itches, what are they going to do? Reach down and scratch. They've got no filter. They've got no ability to think, if I do this, then this is going to be the reaction. So I'm gonna, this is a true story. I had a lady who went to the funeral of her very best friend. And she walked up to the pastor afterwards, and she said, thank you so much for your words. That was beautiful. You just brought back all kinds of wonderful memories about her. About Yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you shared that with me. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I've always heard that bald-headed men are good in bed. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> at a funeral, you know, and it just was not the time or the place. But 
But my people, and I, I don't tell you that story to make any, to, you, you seem like you've got a good sense of humor, so I picked on you. Um, but it doesn't, I'm not telling you that story to embarrass anybody or to make anybody feel bad. It's just my folks will say things and do things that you can't anticipate or predict. So just take a deep breath and let it go. Because they're doing the best they can. So what's going on in the chemical? Now, the structural change is that's a one-way street. It's going to continue across time. The chemical changes, those fluctuate. And so that's why sometimes I can do stuff, and, and sometimes you call me and things are good, and we go and we have a great, and then sometimes I can't do things. That's why these fluctuations are why sometimes you get to see a different side of the person. And a lot of times these kind of things happen when there's somebody else around. So you take your family member to go see the physician or the nurse practitioner or the PA, and you've been explaining to that person how things are going at home, and that person is really struggling and things aren't going well, and that person sitting there in that office can do what? Count backwards from 100 by 7. <laughs> and at home, they can't go get two forks out of a door. And they're not faking it. They're not trying to cover up. It's just those chemicals surge. When they go to DMV, it's another time the chemicals surge. When they go to the attorney, Another time's chemical search, and when family from out of town show up to visit or call, and a lot of times, all of a sudden, they can say things, they can do things, they can't live that way. It's just they can have those little bursts. It's like being on company, but they don't control it. They don't make it happen. It's just the chemicals do that. So here is the good news. Y'all weren't expecting any good news. Here's the good news. This is the brain of a 20-year-old healthy person. This is the brain of an 80-year-old healthy person. And what you're looking at is color. If you compare those two brains, are they mostly the same or mostly different? They're mostly the same. And so if I give these two people a test, what should happen? They should go about the same. If I time the test, what's going to happen? 20-year-olds much faster. Who's actually smarter? Don't you hope you're smarter at 80 than you were at 20? I mean, I really do. We're in big trouble if we don't get smarter. This is what happens to the brains of people with dementia. Now, this is your normal... Oops, I'm sorry. I hit the wrong one. This is your normal brain and two different parts, one going straight through and one going at an angle. So this is your normal, healthy brain. This, and what you're looking at is red. Where it's red is where the brain cells are connecting and working. That's where glucose is being metabolized. And then as it goes through the spectrum, less and less, uh, less, and less glucose is being used. So this purple is actually fluid, and that's normal. It cushions and it cleans the brain. This is early Alzheimer's disease. What do you notice is different? There's a lot less red, especially right here, right? That's that frontal lobe. That's your ability to use logic and reason. And so what happens is, I go to you and I say, now, you've had five wrecks, and you just can't drive anymore. And what's she going to say back to me? Why not? And I'm going to say, well, you, you, you're, not, you're not safe anymore. And what's she going to say? Of course I can drive. I've been, and I, I brought you in this world. I'll take you out. <laughs> And so it's the person doesn't have any ability to see your perspective. All they see is the way they see the world. They don't have any ability to understand your perspective and your logic and your reason. Now, don't be ashamed of this. How many of y'all will admit to being logical? <laughs> don't be ashamed. It doesn't work with people with dementia. It's not a good, helpful kind of thing. Because that's what this is late Alzheimer's. This is an 18 month old baby. Now, did I say treat people with dementia like they're 18 month old babies? 
Will I ever say treat people with dementia like they're 18 month old babies? You know why? 18 month old babies don't like to be treated like they're 18 month old babies. And the other thing is where it doesn't work and it's disrespectful. Because what happens is it's not that things are being removed. Things are kind of collapsing and dying, but they're not being cut out and removed. So there's still stuff in there. So take your fingers and do like this. Put your fingers out, and this is a healthy, healthy brain, lots of connections, lots of working. Imagine it's a pinball machine, all these flippers, hundreds of pinballs, bing, 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 lights going off, all kinds of connections. Put one hand behind your back, use three fingers, pull them up close, then take away most of your pinballs. What's going to happen in this brain? They're not going to be the bells and whistles and the connections. But stuff is still in there. But you don't know when it's going to connect, how it's going to connect, what's going to make it connect. But it's still in there. It's just not connected. And that's why we always need to make sure we're dealing with people in a loving, respectful, dignified. So we want to change our behavior so they can be successful. Now, I get the question almost everywhere I speak about what's the relationship between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And dementia is actually an umbrella term. It's actually a category. And underneath the umbrella are different diseases that cause. So New York is one state. So if you look at an umbrella of states, New York is one of them, right? It's a big one, but it's an important one, but it's only one of them. There are lots of other things that cause dementia that can claim being a state. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type. It's the one, the, the brains I showed you are, it's the one we know probably more about. But you've also got vascular dementia, which is caused by not the brain cells, but by the circulation. So people who have strokes or diabetes or high blood pressure, something disrupts the oxygen and the nutrients getting and the brain tissue beyond that dies. They're a little different. My Alzheimer's folks tend to kind of slow and steady lose abilities from complicated to simple. My people with vascular dementia is much more erratic. They plateau, they get worse, they get a little better. They plateau, they get worse, they get a little better. It's much more erratic. Lewy body dementia. These people have neurological problems with rigidity and stiffness or tremors and memory and language and fluctuations with thinking and a lot of hallucinations and nightmares at the same time. Frontal temporal blood dementia. These people, their memories are fine for quite a long time. Their problem is their frontal lobe doesn't connect. So they're losing the ability to organize and make good decisions and often they have language. It's a different type of different um, group that they have language. So these frontal temporal people, often they're young. They're often in their 50s, or their 40s, or their early 60s. They're often male. So when a 50-year-old man starts drinking too much, driving too fast, cheating on his wife, and not going to work, what do you call him? <laughs> I, I, um, I did a program in North Carolina, in the west of North Carolina, for law enforcement officers, and half of the officers in the room said they would call that person a buddy, and half the officers in the room said they would call that person an inmate, and the one woman in the room said she would call that person ex-husband. And so a lot of times they do wind up in big trouble before they're diagnosed, because their memory is fine, but it's a type of dementia, and they can no more manage their behaviors than people with Alzheimer's disease can. It's not that they're not trying, and we actually had the same group of officers in North Carolina. They walked out to my car <coughs> with me, and they said, there's a guy we're working with, and he's not showing up for his shifts, or he's showing up late, and he's pulling his gun. And they're getting ready to fire him. They're documenting. They're working. You know, they treat chest him for drug and alcohol. He's not using drugs or alcohol. They're getting ready. They they went and sent him for an evaluation. He had this type of dementia. He died a couple years later from the disease. But he died having retired on disability. Now, does that make a difference to his wife and two little children? Yes. Yes. Makes a huge difference. If you've got people in your neighborhood and your family, don't assume that it's not something that's really going on. 
progression of dementia. This is based on Alzheimer's, and it's based on the idea that behavior changes and abilities change slowly across time, particularly with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So the, the most common, I mean, the, the, the earliest level is, or we call them diamonds because they're rigid and stubborn, and it's not that they don't want to change, it's if you can't get new stuff in, what are you left with? The old stuff. Emeralds are people who are living in the past, so that's what I'm looking for my son. And I'm not looking for him, I'm looking for who? Me. <laughs> I'm looking for that little baby that I used to run around with. Yeah. Emeralds, Emeralds, these are people who are in the moment, they're safety issues, that they touch things and they feel things and they don't really care if it's uncomfortable for you, they do it anyway. Rubies, people are walking, but they're not really paying attention much. And then the end of life, the last stage, we call pearls. And the reason we do that is because we spend a lot more time thinking about the shell than we do the person. And so we spend a lot more time thinking about the outsides of the person than we do what's deep inside them that makes them them. So what it comes down to when you've got somebody in your life with dementia is who gets to make the choices and decisions about how, about how you're going to interact. We do, right? Because you can control your behavior. What, can you control their behavior? What can you control? What you do. So it comes down to do you want to tangle or do you want to tang up? Would you rather dance or fight? I'd rather dance, but I can teach you how to do either because I spent a lot of time tangling with people. So I can tell you how to do either of these. So this is going to be um, where we're going to kind of end up. When you tangle with somebody, you think you know what's wrong, but you don't really get good information. When you tangle with somebody, you argue with them. Now, who in this room is good at arguing and will admit it? Okay. So I have not taken a shower in way too long. And you can tell from outside my room that I haven't taken a shower way. So you tell me I need to take a shower before I go to the doctor, okay? I've already taken my shower. Of course I put on deodorant. I've got my grown-up clothes on. I took my shower. I'm dressed. I'm ready to go. I've got on deodorant. If you smell something stinking, it's your own nasty self. Now, take a deep breath and let it go. Now, is she going to win? Because I don't have any frontal lobe. And basically what she's doing with this, put your hand up like this, and do this with somebody next to you. Just put your hand against their palm, and, and we want politicians to reach across the aisle. We need to, too. So everybody kind of reach out with her. Now, give your person a little push. Now, when you push, what does your person do back? And then what do you do? And then what do they do? And then what do you do? And pretty soon you're turning red in the face and you're starting to sweat. But you are not going to go anywhere. It is better to be kind than to be right. So let go of needing to be right. Because when we tango, we go with the flow. Now, I'm not going to make the flow. I'm not going to create the flow. But I told her exactly why I think I've already had my shower put on my deodorant. And what did I tell What did I tell her? I'm already dressed. How many of y'all got up this morning, got dressed, and then went and took the showers? You never know. <laughs> Some days are like that. <laughs> but most of the time, you get cleaned up and then you get dressed. And so if she wants me to get cleaned up for the doctor, when does she need to be there? Before I'm dressed. Because once I'm dressed, what is in my mind? I'm dressed, I'm ready to go. When you tangle, you take over too quickly. So reach over to that person next to you and just touch them on the back of their hand. Just kind of take turns. Just reach over and just touch somebody on their hand. And y'all don't mind that. Now don't leave her out. When you reach over and kind of mess with her too. Yeah. Y'all don't mind that. Now reach over and just kind of pat your person on their shoulder. And you don't mind that too much. Now reach over and pat your person on the top of their head. And people are, y'all are giggling. You like this a lot. Now reach over and pat the person on their
their cheek. <laughs> and they'll get the middle of their chest. And everybody's like, uh-uh, I got it. Sorry, that's okay. That's not, I got it. We do things to people with dementia that would get us kicked out of Target. <laughs> we do. Because what happens is, if I'm standing in line behind her, and her tag is sticking out, and she's in line ready to check out, and I just reach up and fix her tag, what's she going to do when she turns around? Yeah, because she didn't know I was there, and we do this kind of stuff to people with dementia all the time. We do this kind of thing. We start an interaction before they even know that we're there, and it gets them really scared and startled. You want to help instead at the level of loss. If you want to tangle, ignore what the person says and does. Now, I had a gentleman who was at an assisted living care facility, and he walked up to a group of ladies sitting there at the table. He said, hey, baby, hey, baby, listen, it's going to rain. Hey, baby, listen, listen, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's going to rain. Listen, baby, I'm telling you, you better get ready. It's going to rain. And he unzipped. Oh, and it rained. Oh, and, and he wasn't trying, he was doing everything he could with what he had left to warn him. He was giving them every chance they had. They were warning that person with dementia to do what? Pardon me, could you escort me to the, to the gentleman's room? It's just not going to happen. You have to listen, but not just listen with your ears. You have to listen with your ears and your eyes and your heart and your spirit. And when you do that, then you really know what that person with dementia is trying to communicate to you and with you. If you want to tangle, treat the person like a child. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't you look cute? <laughs> You're just adorable. <laughs> and even children don't like that. Instead, Simplify instead of babyfying. And so simplifying means I still treat the person with respect, but I don't overwhelm them with information and requests. I don't give them a series of things to do, and what they can hold on to is one. I change so they can be successful. If you want to tangle, do this with me, please. Bring your shoulders up like this. Bring your hands up like this. Put your mouth to one side, squint one eye. Now look at the person next to you and say, but I'm just trying to help you. Because <laughs> the truth is, that's what some of y'all look like. When you go in to spend some time with that person, right? That's what you look like when you're in a hurry or when you're frustrated, where things aren't going well for you. That's what you start to look like. So when you tangle, you think about the differences between us and the person with dementia. When you, and you interpret their behavior. If, if, she, if I, she does have dementia, and I do do something, like just straighten her, and I tell her, your tag is sticking out, and she turns around and hits me, who's gonna get in trouble? She is, right? Because she just turned around and hit me. Um, and I will interpret her behavior as being what? Aggressive. Aggressive. She's really just what? Okay. Trying to protect herself. And so we have to change our responses from thinking of the person as being resistant or aggressive or mean or manipulative to realizing that the truth is we're all the same. They're just like we are. We're just like they are. And so when you think about people with dementia, the most important part of that is the people part. Because that's what really makes a difference. Now you've got a lot of other information for resources and resources um, and information. Um, I do want to talk about this just a little bit because a lot of the questions that people email me and ask me about have to do with um, how do I get my person to go to the doctor? You know, how do I get my mom to take a bath? How do I get my dad to stop driving? How do I get my um, my 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 spouse to um, let me take over the the checkbooks? Those are the kinds of questions I get. 
And it's not, there aren't any if-then kinds of answers. Because the reason why one person struggles with something is really different from the reason why another person struggles with something. So I'm going to go through a process. I'm going to tell you one more little story, and then we'll have some questions. So the first thing I want to really think about is what is the problem? Because I really want to think about when does it happen? Where does it happen? What's going on? What time of day? What, what does the person say? What does the person do? I really want to describe it and really think about it. Because too often we label behaviors. And when you label her as aggressive, you don't really understand what really was going on with her reaction. The second is understanding who the person is. Let me ask you something. How many of y'all like to be in charge? Guess what's not going to go away when you get dementia? <laughs> You're still going to want to be in charge. Um, how many of y'all like to be around people? Y'all are going to still want to be around people. How many of y'all like to be with yourself? Y'all are still going to want to be with yourself. People say people. So I want to know what kind of work did this person do? What was their personality like? What did they do when things were good? What did they do when things were challenging? What were the best things that ever happened in their life? And what were the most difficult things that happened in their life? I want to know that. And then I want to come up with a possible cause. How do I really understand? Thinking about this person and this problem, how do I really understand what's going on? I want to come up with a plan, practice it, and then pass on what works. Does it work so everybody can be consistent? So let me tell you my story. I got a phone call to come and spend some time with a lady who was in an assisted living facility. And they loved her. They thought she was wonderful. They, she ate all of her food. She didn't eat anybody else's food. Um, she was a retired minister's wife. She was very friendly and gentle and, and affectionate and kind, except when it was time for what? <coughs> Clothes? For bath. When it's time for her to get cleaned up, things did not go well. And she would scream and she would yell and she would scratch and she would use profanity and she would kick and she would pinch. And she didn't just pinch. She'd actually pinch and then she'd twist, which really hurts. And so I went to see what was going on with her. And we, we were walking down the hall and she's singing, and, and I'm walking with her, and it's going well, and we get to the shower room, and I get her dress off, and she's doing fine, I get her shoes off, and her socks off, and her, she had a little hose, knee high hose off, and we're doing fine, I'm gonna take her slip off, and she says, I'm gonna knock the crap out of you. <laughs> and so, she didn't say crap, though. <laughs> and, and so what I, um, I did is I wound up giving her her shower in her slip. And guess what happened? She got clean. <laughs> because thinking about it, the problem was she became very distressed when? To when it was time to take her slip off. Who was she as a person? And, and the stereotype is modest, and that generation tended to be a little more modest. So how do I understand what's really happening? But why was she getting distressed? It wasn't that she didn't want a bath. It's that she didn't want to be naked. So then I gave her her shower with her slip on, and it went really well. Now the question that always comes up is, then what? Has anybody ever had on a wet slip? <laughs> what does a wet slip feel like? They're slimy and uncomfortable, and they cling, and not in a good way, and they're just really not very good. You really want to get a wet, slimy, clingy slip off. So that came off, warm panels, and we went on about our business. Now, if this gentleman gets Alzheimer's disease, am I going to put him in a slip to get him a shower? <laughs> Not unless y'all know something I don't know. Um, because it's probably not part of his everyday life. He's wearing nice khakis and a button down shirt. I don't see a slip. Um, so it's probably not something that would work for him. But I might give him a shower and a pair of boxers. And he might do really well with that. And so we want to really individualize and think about who is this person and what can we do to make things work for them. So I want to pause.
And I want to take a few minutes, and again, um, at 6.30, the formal part of the program is over, so we've got about six minutes, and I'm sorry for that, um, that, that I talked a little longer than I had planned to, but I'll hang around and ask questions. So what kind of questions do y'all have? Yes, sir. On one of the slides, you talked about vascular dementia. Yes, sir. Which is caused maybe by a lack of oxygen or pressure on the artery. Yes, sir. And diabetes as well. When it comes to the other category there, that Lewy body, mm -hmm. what is the cause of that? I happen to know a friend of mine who died of that. Yeah. And it was fast moving. He was like 61 when it was diagnosed and 65 when he passed away. Mm -hmm. Whether the loss of life is truly attributable to that, I certainly don't know. But At that age, I would think probably. Yeah, and up until that point, he was a very successful guy. Mm -hmm. And then very much in control, and then all of a sudden it just ended. It started to decline. His wife didn't even think much of it at the beginning. But <clears throat> what caused that? I can see the vascular, the pressure on sure. the arteries, and diabetes. And, and that's a great question. The question was, you know, how do you know um, why something is happening? And we, we know less about Lewy body than we do about some of the others. Because um, there doesn't seem to be a really strong family. Maybe in some other kinds of, there's some other neuromuscular kinds of problems in, in families that have Lewy body, but it, it's not like um, sickle cell disease where if someone's got it, you're going to get it. It's much more, um, and, and with Alzheimer's disease, we know more about than the Lewy body. It's more kind of a combination of genetic predisposition and then lifestyle kind of behaviors um, that kind of work together to make your risk greater or less. Um, but with Lewy body, we're still figuring a lot of those kinds of things out. I had never heard of it until passed away. And it's really, in those families, a lot of times you find people with Gehrig's disease or you find other kind of progressive neuromuscular <laughs> kinds of things, yeah. But there's a lot we're still learning about these things. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. One is, Dementia is the umbrella. Yes. Then there's different types of dementia. Yes. Who determines the type of dementia that a patient has? Yes. Great question. Um, so the diagnostic process is you look at um, the, the history of the symptoms, you look at the person's health history, an excellent physical exam, which is more than just take a deep breath, take a deep breath, listen to your heart. A really good physical exam looking at heart and lung and neurological challenges. Then um, lab studies to look for something that might be reversible, like B12 deficiency or, or um, fluid electrolyte imbalances, dehydration. And we also look at things like um, depression can make people behave like they've got dementia. We look for other kinds of chronic mental illness. We look for, I'm a big proponent of doing brain scans. You know, because I really want to see what's going on where and if it makes sense with um, really good neuro neuropsychological um, testing, looking at all of those things. So you get all of that information and then you see which part of it fits best. And the other thing is people can sometimes have more than one type of dementia at the same time in the same brain. So the most common we truly think is Alzheimer's. The second most common could be a mixed dementia with vascular and Alzheimer's or Lewy body and Alzheimer's or frontal temporal and Alzheimer's. Um, and so people can have more than one type of dementia in the same brain at the same time. And you have a second, second question? question is, you don't just take a parent and go to an assisted living place or a memory care place and say, my mom has to live here now. Mm -hmm. What is the next step? What is um, the next step? If, if someone doesn't can't safely live at home? Yes. Um, that's a really complicated question, and, and I'm going to speak generally, but for your specific situation, you're probably going to want to reach out to um, ABRC. They have people who can help you through that process. Generally speaking, what I've found is it doesn't do well if I back people into corners. And what I mean by that is if I was to tell somebody, you have to do this, you have no choice, and it's forever. Then I'm going to get resistance. So I'm usually really subtle, and I usually will say things like, you know, we need to get some work done on the house. Because doesn't everybody's house need some work? I mean, so we need to get some work done on the house. We'd really like you to stay here for a while, and let's see how things go. 
So I'm not going to say always and never. Um, sometimes, and she said, you know, physicians or nurse practitioners, PA, sometimes if the person has that relationship where they'll do what that person says because they say, some of the people in the faith community have that kind of relationship or, or attorneys sometimes have that kind of relationship because you really need to do this, it's time. Most people, when you're told to do something, it, it, people tend to kind of push back. And so um, I'm a big proponent and say, let's just try this and see how it goes. And, and not, you know, we're selling your house, you're never going back home. Yeah. So I think her question was next, and then I'll get yours. Just say, um, am I correct that you just said there is a relationship between bouts with of depression and bouts with dementia? Is that the, is the chemical? There are a couple of things there the relationship between dementia and depression. Um, and it's complex. Untreated depression is a risk factor for developing dementia. And we think that has to do with the health of the brain cells, you know, that aren't taking it. Now, remember, I said untreated. You know, treated depression they, is, is a completely different issue. Untreated depression. The other thing that's important is about 50% of people with dementia will also have depression at some point during their disease. And so a lot of times it doesn't look, people don't look sad, they don't sound depressed, but they may be really irritable. And that can be a sign of depression in somebody with dementia as well. So they're closely related. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, when you said brain scan, is it an MRI sufficient? An MRI or a PET scan, and there are different reasons, or, or a CT scan, there are different reasons why they do different ones. Um, the cool thing about the PET scans is people can be in the scan and they can do work. And so then you can really see which part of the brain is working when it's working. And that's really helpful in the right situation. Um, the only way Medicare currently pays for PET scans is if you're trying to differentiate between Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal lobe dementia. Um, but you know, that's one good, another good reason for getting involved in research is a lot of those things that aren't paid for are actually included in research protocol. So it's kind of a good way to get some of that, that testing done sometimes. Yes, ma'am. I, I, a long time ago, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward did a film called Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. And she was a college professor that developed Alzheimer's. And he waited a long time before he got some assistance. It was really interesting. And I think Julianne Moore just won the Academy Award for Still Alice. That's a DVD, because I have that at home, I haven't watched it yet. And I think the more, the more it becomes something we talk about. If we see something like that, mm -hmm. I think it helps us understand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good way to kind of get the message out there, because the, the days of when we need to, to ignore this problem and hope it goes away, you know, we can't do that anymore. It's not safe for the person, it's not in their best interest. And so that really doesn't work. So we need to have conversations. We need to talk about the signs and the symptoms and when you start to see changes. Yes, ma'am. Um, what about drugs and alcohol? Drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, out, there's a type of dementia that is specifically related to Alzheimer's, I mean, to alcohol, um, to kind of chronic alcohol abuse and misuse. Anything that changes the environment of your brain increases your risk of developing dementia. And so we, you know, drugs and alcohol aren't good for your brain. I mean, just generally. Now, there, there are studies out there, and they say, you know, you read the studies, and it says, any serving of alcohol a day reduces your risk of developing dementia. And that's been pretty consistent through the years, like a glass of red wine. But think about it. It's a glass. Have you ever noticed that the more you pay for it, the less you get? <laughs> and so it's like a glass of wine that you get at a really nice restaurant. You know, it's a serving, a day, and you can't save them up for the weekend. <laughs> so it's like, you know, a serving, a day, but, but chronic misuse, overuse of alcohol and drugs is not good for your brain. Yes, ma'am. Can Alzheimer's uh, affect hearing? A person has <coughs> hearing aids? And, um, Sometimes can hear perfectly well with that, sometimes can hear. Um, the hearing aids can be falling out, and often fall out and get lost. And I would say, don't you, can't you feel this thing on the edge? Can't you feel it's falling out or whatever? Or can't you see the cell on the working? 
and I never get an answer. Mm -hmm. Is that because of dementia? Why? Or is it there's no I don't understand why you can't feel your hearing aid isn't sitting in um, a lot of times what happens with dementia is things that we um, don't pay attention to, they don't filter. So every little thing that's going on that they have to process is something else they can't process. So if they're in a room and there's noise going on in conversation and they're trying to understand what's going on, they can't try to understand what's going on and notice that the hearing aid is falling out. And so they, they can't really put those things together. Um, and so they really, they can, sometimes, hearing is a separate issue. Hearing, um, sometimes what happens is hearing changes with age and age is associated with dementia as well. But sometimes also what happens is when we're trying to get a message across, I'm gonna pick on the women now. Do you remember when you were a little kid and your mom would call you in from the yard and the first time your mom called you, it was like, Melanie, Kevin, Wendy, y'all need to come inside. It's time for supper. And the next time mom calls it, Melanie, y'all, Kevin, Brad, we can give you food. And then the third time she called, it said only dogs could hear it. <laughs> and so what tends to happen is when your voice gets shriller and more distressed, the person can't hear you as well. And so um, sometimes it's that the person can't hear. Sometimes people lip read and they don't really realize they're doing it. So there are all kinds of different factors that could be going on there. Um, but but did you want to ask something else? The second that? question was a blank stare. You've been talking and more or less carrying well, the one almost one side conversation. Mm -hmm. The person is listening, mm -hmm. looking at you, maybe you want to say something. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes just zone. Mm -hmm. And I think, is there anything in my brain? What, and I'll, sometimes I say, what are you thinking about? I mean, I, it's looking like maybe I'm looking over my shoulder or just nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's empty. I think yeah. the brain is empty. What is going on? And sometimes people are, are inside their head thinking things. And they're remembering and they're dreaming and there are things in there that, um, and sometimes it takes, it's hard work. It's like, have you ever um, been learning a new language? and how hard you have to work to pay, and you can't do that all day long, you get too tired. So they work hard and they work hard and then they just can't keep working that hard anymore. So I think sometimes that's where some of that kind of comes from. Yes, sir. You progress to your mid or late 80s. Uh, and does that, that PET scan with burgundy and red areas mm -hmm. kind of uh, light in color, is that inevitable or is one out of 100 their brain is shot okay. as they were when they were 30. That's a great question. So the statistics, about 50% of people over age 85 will have some kind of chronic change in their thinking. In their thinking, but not yeah. dementia. It might be dementia. Often it is, but it could be something else. It could be depression that's not diagnosed, delirium that's not diagnosed. But of people over age 85, it's about 50%. Of people over age 65, it's about 10%. So there's a lot more people without problems with their thinking, but people with problems with their thinking use a lot of resources. They use a lot of healthcare resources, they use a lot of financial resources, they use a lot of resources. Yes, sir? In terms of um, medication, will you use, uh, for example, both Exelon, Patch, and the vendor at the same time, maybe an individual okay. in your community, for example? Right. Um, the medications that are currently approved by the FDA, you've got two groups. You've got one that's Exelon, Aricept, and Razidine, and you've got one that's Mimenda. The Exelon, Aricept, and Razidine work on a chemical called acetylcholine. The Razidine works, I mean, the, the Mimenda, Mimentine works on a chemical called glutamate. So they work on different chemicals. Part of the passing the FDA approval was a study that put all that put Aricept and Mimenda in in the same study, and so the testing is very consistent that they should complement and work together. And so that's kind of the standard: is you start the cholinesterase um, um, first, and then you add on the Mimentine, the Mimenda towards the middle. That's kind of the standard practice. <coughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to get involved to get someone involved in a. 
Um, there are a lot of different resources, and I would probably start by contacting um, the AERC, and they can kind of direct you to local groups that are doing research. Um, there are national um, um, websites. The NIH has some websites that list yeah, what research is being done. The, on the AERC website, we have all the links to the clinical trials. The links to the clinical trials. Can you um, the, um, the one center, the, there are three of them, there are two groups, and one of them is Aricept, Exelon, and Razidine. It's A-R-I-C-E-P-T, I-C-E-P-T. I'm not recommending it. You would take that, right? I'm not recommending any of these medications for any better people. Exelon, E-X-E-L-O-N. And Razidine, R A Z Y D Y N A, E, something like so, that. So let me tell you what the new, the new part is all of a sudden we got comfortable. Someone is um, prescribing the Exelon patch with the Aricet with the hand. Yeah. People are doing all kinds of things, and they're they're doing they're trying it with children with ADD. They're trying, and, and typically, I mean. That's off-label, that's not FDA approved, but people can try things, and if they're educated, they can, can try those things and kind of make those decisions. Um, I will say, generally speaking, because, who do you test Alzheimer's drugs on? People with Alzheimer's disease. People with Alzheimer's disease tend to be what? Older, and, and so the medications, generally speaking, tend to be fairly well taught, but anybody in the world can have an adverse reaction from anything in the world. So be really careful about that. Yes, sir. This was great. Really nice uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And a lot of good ideas in here. Thank you. Uh, I maybe just didn't cover it. One of the things I have trouble with is motivation. Right. I, mean, I understand the six people sure. on that straight and you jump to your level. Mm -hmm. But I've worked with a man who was on the Right. What can I do to okay. help them? That's a great question. But, but, and, and because part of what, where <laughs> you're getting started comes from is this frontal lobe. This frontal lobe is the part of the brain that helps you initiate and get started. And so a lot of times what happens is it's how you start that conversation. So if I go in and I say, what do you want to do today? No, okay, so what do you say? Well, what's your choices? This, this, or this, which do you think you would like? Okay. What would be more fun to do? Yeah. Choice. And, and how does he respond? Okay. Okay. So, okay. so, so sometimes, sometimes you have to back up and you have to say, stand up. Let's get. No. No. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk a little bit more specifically afterwards. And a lot of it depends on the level of dementia, the personality. Yeah. Well, nothing's going to work, and I'm not going to help you either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other questions?